My name is Swami Jasrajpuri. I'm from Kirawee in Sydney. Uh, how did I come to where I am now? Good question. I started off, for me, spirituality started in school. It started in English class. And um, with the romantic poets, and I live very close to the bush, to the national park. So I spend a lot of time there and um, just exploring nature. And I could really feel some connection with it and feel some connection with that. Um, that energy and there was a real peace inside but I couldn't get it to be permanent it didn't go in my daily life and that's where my search started and then I started with yoga and slowly through yoga I came actually to my Guruji Swami Maheshwaranandji who was in Sydney at one time and I met him there and he advised me to, sometime to come to India and I'd always wanted to go to India although I had no idea for what or why or how or for how long or anything and I sort of decided to go for a few months and see how it is and that's now 14 15 years ago and I've been there ever since in the last years in where I'm staying in India slowly slowly Guruji's given me more and more responsibilities especially with the public and in the last Kumbh Mela, which was in Haidvar, then, then um, I was made into what is called Mahamandaleshwar. It's actually one of the heads of the um, Hindu monk, well, the Hindu sannyasi uh, groups which are in India. There's actually a, uh, an organization called the Akara. Akara is a place where the um, sannyasis, the monks, are like members and it's there for protecting the Dharma, for protecting the ancient culture and the teachings and the Vedant, which is the, the philosophy. Um, so my role there is somehow as a, as a teacher to, to guide and to advise the other sannyasis who are on the path and who are searching. At the same time, the main role for me um, is in our ashram in Pali and with all of my Guruji's disciples, followers, who are throughout India mainly, and, and to, well, let's say when he's not there to take care of them, that they can come and ask for advice. My normal day, it starts early, about four o'clock, and I do my own practice till about 7.30 or eight o'clock. If I have time, I go and check in our school. We run a school, there's 1,500 students there. Um, if I have time, I also go and see how things are functioning in our hospital because we also have a 100 bedded hospital and we have one animal refuge. Otherwise, there's just the day to day running of all that. It's quite a big community. The ashram has about six or seven hundred people living there. Generally, in a day, a thousand people or two thousand people would move in and out and come and go. Um, when you have a relation with a guru, it's, 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 something, it's a bit beyond words. It starts off as something and ends up as something completely different. Um, he's, he's a guide, he's, he's in one way like a father, he's in one way like a mother, he's in one way like the, the point of your worship, so many aspects in one. But for me the experience over the years is as I go further and further on the path is that it just gets closer and closer and um, it's like he's speaking through you and speaking inside you even when he's not there and you end up just having this such a strong connection it's undescribable he's the one who puts you on the, the path and guides also your spiritual practice but generally he's there and just when he sees that you're going off the path or, or losing your direction a little bit then he puts you back on puts you back on the path the hard work you still have to do yourself but the guru is there to give you the road give you the map as far as practicing practicing is something um, it changes very much over the years and it changes according to your experience and as you become more and more experienced at it then you you learn how your body reacts it's actually like a big personal experiment like a science experiment there's a there's a uh, you, you do a process and then you see the results and you learn what that does for you and, and when it's useful for you so I don't have like a, a fixed practice that, that's there every day the same but it depends very much on the circumstances that are there there may be times when because of the, the day that's or the period that's around that you're so busy with other things that you need to do more uh, asanas, more postures because you just need to release that tension which is there. And there's other times when it's really steady and, and just running nicely in the daily life and then that's the time to go in and do um, 
meditation more. Now in our in in our um, parampara, in the, the lineage of, of our gurus, there's one saying that um, you don't dive for the pearls when the ocean is too high. So you know when it's that peaceful time when you really feel inside a peace, then you would go deep in meditation. And there's other times when um, the mind is moving or, or there's too many other things going on. That's the time to go to breathing and go to to asanas and so on. So you can't say it's fixed, but there's a, the the motive is fixed, the the reason is fixed, and you're always heading towards that goal. And when you become more experienced at yoga, it doesn't mean it matter if the situation, if your if your place where you are is completely turned upside down. But with experience, you have the the tools with you inside you that can turn you back and get you peaceful again very very quickly. And that's practice. For me, the goal of yoga yoga is a tool, and we're we're aiming for realization to become one with that that greater oneness which is there. That, that oneness which pervades everything. Um, in the um, Upanishads, there's one mantra, Punamada Punamidam Punat Punamada Chate Punasi Punamadaya Punameva Vasishyate. And basically, it's just saying that it's all one and it's all coming from one, and we are also from that one. Everything is one. You know, it's one wholeness, and it's coming back to being part of that. Like the. Um, like when the river comes back into the ocean, or when this, when you you just dissolve back into the ocean and again become one of that, become one with that bliss which is there. And yoga is about calming down the mind and calming down the uh, the the vrittis, the the vibrations which are there within us, which keep us away from that oneness and calming ego and settling and just coming slowly 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 back towards our roots towards our origin it's not just about being healthy it is about being healthy because good health allows you to practice better and it allows you to calm down and it allows you to go inside but um, the real goal of yoga is not about asanas and pranayam but it's about meditation and about losing your ego and about losing your your sorrow without losing doubt and losing delusion and coming back to reality also part of, of yoga philosophy is that there's no actual right and wrong, you know, there's, there's only, you move away from delusion and you move further into delusion. And the important thing for us to do is to make our actions pure. There's four aspects of yoga there. One is about asan pranayam raja yoga, which is generally what we think of in the public. And then there's karma yoga, which is to serve other people, which is to, to serve humanity as a whole. In, in one Upanishad it says, Midam Savam Yatkim Chajagatam Tena Tena You know, when you recognize that this is all one, then how can you be greedy about what somebody else has? And when you recognize that it's all one, then if I'm helping you, then then I'm helping myself because we're all part of that one Paramatma. And that is service. It goes for everybody. And it also helps to purify you and helps to, to guide you towards that goal. Third is bhakti. Bhakti means devotion. And devotion is, I mean, to, to just look to that concept of everything being one is not easy. And in between there's, there's steps there. And through devotion either to your guru or towards a, a, a form of God, it's a, a step along the path. And eventually we're all going that all is one. But it makes it easier for us to, to have a concept when we can actually have a figure there in front of us or something that we can relate to and something that can advise us. And the, the fourth is gyan, is to remove that, that veil which is over us, which is keeping us from that reality. And, and when we practice, in one way or the other, we're doing all four types of yoga. It, different personalities go at it in different ways, different gurus also teach in different ways. We're all going towards that one goal. We have to have a, to perfect at least one of them and then all of the others also come in front of us.